Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst and I'm here with Meher Roy. Today, we're speaking with Lawrence Ayan and Vincent Weiser, who are respectively stewards of longevity deal flow um, at VitaDAO and the ecosystem lead at Molecule. VitaDAO is a DAO whose goal it is to promote longevity research. We had VitaDAO on a while back together with its sister project, Molecule, um, which is an NFT IP project targeting, targeting pharmaceutical researchers. Um, we're interested in the larger DSI landscape today and hope Lawrence and Vincent can lay this out for us. And we'll also hear about what's new at VitaDAO. So before we talk with Lawrence and Vincent, um, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can manage all of your assets in one place. But what's really special about Omni is what you can do inside the wallet. Want to get yield? Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees in three taps. Need to swap? Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs, so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction. Love NFTs? Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains in one place. Omni truly is the easiest way to use Web3 and is fully self-custodial, meaning you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself, of course. And they support Ledger. Give it a try at omni.app. Fantastic. Lawrence and Vincent, it's a pleasure to have you guys on. Um, before we kind of dive into this entire longevity and DSI um, topic, give us some background on yourselves. Thanks for having us, big uh, fan of the Epicenter podcast. Um, yeah, so my, maybe the uh, my background is basically just like entering kind of earlier in, in uh, the building of like websites and uh, startups in my teens. And then I think discovering Ethereum in 2015 or 16 and actually being mainly excited really by um, this idea of the DAO. Like I discovered and, and heard of Bitcoin before from friends, but it didn't really capture me as much as um, this possibility of, of kind of like uh, dApps built on Ethereum, such as the DAO. Um, so I explored that into much more depth and um, then built like a Ethereum decentralized exchange called DexBlue in 2017 and explored also kind of like the DeFi space. And actually at the same time, also um, try to figure out like what are different ways to have the biggest impact and explore different areas from effective altruism to um, like AI and, and other areas, but really um, also deeply got into longevity research, went to conferences and read up on a lot of books um, to get into it. And um, while my focus was mainly on more like the product design and software side, I, I wanted to kind of leverage it for good and, and to advance science. So I actually met then uh, Paul and Tyler, who were at the time in 2021 20, uh, building out Molecule as kind of like the marketplace to fund research and this IPNFT marketplace. And at the time, they already had explored a lot of experiments like bonding curves for science funding and a bunch of other things. And shared with me also the idea um, of VitaDAO, so kind of like using um, this mechanism of DAOs to fund research, which really stick with me. I actually, funnily enough, like a year before, tried to register longevitydao.com, uh, and, and, but I didn't have a team or people um, to kickstart it with. But then with Paul and Tyler, I was really excited to join them and many other stewards and people that came together uh, yeah, to initiate this experiment. Um, yeah, so then I get involved into um, helping create VitaDAO with many others, and um, yeah, and now I'm leading ecosystem efforts as well at uh, Molecule and really helping the VitaDAO for X, so the VitaDAO for women's health, for climate research, for other um, research areas to, uh, to thrive. So that's kind of like a, the short intro about myself. Maybe before we kind of pass over to you, Lawrence, Vincent, you're a young guy, you're in your 20s. What kind of attracted you to longevity research? Because kind of kind of dying for people our age usually seems a really long way off, right? Yeah, I think like the the easiest way I think to to describe it, I think is actually probably from like my even grandparents' generation, like to see them like 
increasingly deteriorate and and suffer and really like not being able to live anymore really like like being in old people's home having dementia of course dying um uh like at some point from age related diseases and and i, I just realized i think it was like subconscious at first that like that, that doesn't seem really right that you're like suffering for like 20 30 years and um, are not able to really participate in society um, and I think it's like very obvious for people that like solving cancer, Alzheimer, like all of these things is extremely important. And it wasn't obvious to me at the time that like uh, there's actually like a more neglected and underappreciated way to um, treat these uh, age-related diseases, which is t trying to tackle the root causes of those diseases. So actually, um, yeah, I discovered also some books and I think actually by kind of like getting into the weeds um of like okay what what is the biggest ways to improve um humanity like longevity sticked out as one of the biggest um yeah, potential opportunities to really improve health in a more radical and uh, groundbreaking fundamental way instead of treating cancer once it's there i want to make sure i never get cancer or every anyone else for that matter so um yeah that was kind of like my driver into longevity and actually it was funnily enough when i reflected on it um also, folks like Vitalik and the crypto people really getting into it kind of like in intensified even the interest because that made it for me, um, yeah, more, even more obvious that it's something to, uh, yeah, look into more deeply. Why do you think longevity research societally somewhat stigmatized? So, right. So basically, if you say you're a cancer researcher, you know, obviously that's fantastic if you're, you're an, Alzheimer's researcher, obviously, that's also fantastic. Your diabetes researcher, go for it. But it's basically, if, if you say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a longevity researcher, people usually assume you're a crackpot who kind of thinks, you know, people should live forever and never die and kind of like, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's almost esoteric in a way, right? Totally. Yeah. I think the, the main thing, like my explanation for it is, uh, of course, that it's like a communication problem also by the people who really embrace it and then drive home this narrative of like, hey, we want to live to a thousand years. Like I've heard it from many people, say, uh, especially also on crypto say, which I think is not wrong, but it's of course gives the wrong impression to most uh, people. And I think it's also, of course, media driving home a narrative that is divisive and kind of populist of like, yeah, billionaires want to live forever and this and that and ultimately i think it's it's not really true in the sense that they like ultimately uh, even if like a jeff bezos is funding research in that space like uh everyone would benefit from that research in the same way as if he funds cancer research and no one would have a problem if he solves cancer um and i think yeah it's, it's ultimately i think a media thing but also that the community is um especially early on really embraced this narrative of like living to 500 to 1000 so like being immortal, which of course doesn't uh, stick well, which I think probably even has some complex like religious roots. Like no one, of course, would say today like, "Hey, we should only live to 50 because that's what we used to live to uh, 100 or 200 years ago." Everyone thinks it's normal to live to 90. So I think it's yeah, I, I think kind of like an anchoring bias to the um, what's known today, but also a bit um, of like a coping mechanism with okay, like uh, looking death into the eye, we'll, we'll all die with 90 can't be 100 or like 120 at the end it's just like a random number and i think like if one says okay like life is fun and good like why not have more healthy uh life i think is pretty obvious of course there's i think also some misbeliefs or uh, misconceptions on like hey even if people live healthy to 90 that it's bad for the world it's actually the best thing that could happen to the world because it's like one of the biggest expenses in our world is for the frailing healthcare system for all societies uh, like, for example, uh, Japan really is struggling with, um, like, a very shifting demographic. And I think in that sense, it's, like, a very, uh, very obviously good thing, especially get, for example, everyone to live healthy to 90. But I think uh, there's also, like, a shift now happening, I think, to an extent. I can also say that um, this paradigm really makes sense to address the root cause of disease instead of what pharma usually does, which is symptom palliation. Um, it's, it's mostly been that. So may, maybe except for antibiotics and, and vaccines, most therapies for diseases today don't actually address the root molecular cause of the disease. Um, 
So for example, Alzheimer's drugs, they just enhance cognitive function in the near term. Cardiovascular drugs like statins or blood pressure meds, they don't address the root cause of vascular aging. Um, and so it's mostly been like damage control, kind of cutting off the heads of the, the ancient Greek hydra. You cut off its heads and, and, and two, one head and, and two grow back. And it's like that with, with aging and age-related diseases. Prevention is better than, uh, than symptom palliation, right? Do, do you think um, the, entire, um, the entire ecosystem could kind of um, benefit from a reframing from kind of living longer to, you know, living your full lifespan healthier? Because obviously no one wants to be old for a long time, right? Because, I mean, as you said, being old often sucks. I mean, so basically kind of, you know, deteriorating mental function, kind of deteriorating health. It's it's not a piece of cake. So I wouldn't, so basically, if you look at the average 95-year-old, I wouldn't want to be 95 for 50 years. So basically, it's, I want to be, I mean, I'm 36 now. Um, I would like to be 36 for, you know, 50 more years, and that would be awesome. But uh, do you think kind of reframing it that way, might help. Definitely, we've. I mean, it's it's decentralized, right? Some people are framing it in such certain ways. Some people are framing it in another way. This is obviously a, a better framing to start with. I think some people just like to catch that attention and say, "Look, we're going to be immortal." The, the first, the person who lived to a thousand is born today, and and kind of rising up some some interesting, um, just turning heads, you know. Um, so it's it's a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it totally makes sense. And, and people are usually okay with curing diseases. You know, they think, oh, curing cancer is great, right? But even if you cured every single type of cancer tomorrow, uh, that would only increase uh, health span or lifespan by about two to three years on a population level, because all of these diseases grow up, uh, grow exponentially in, in uh, incidence. Aging is an exponential process. So if you're not going to get cancer, or if you cure cancer, then you're going to get car cardiovascular disease or diabetes or Alzheimer's or stroke and so on. Um, but yeah, like we try to, to communicate it in, in various ways, but other people will communicate it in other ways. Uh, question is who gets more attention? <laughs> we got sidetracked a little bit here into this longevity narrative um, arc. Um, Lawrence, tell us about yourself before we kind of uh, dive into uh, the much larger landscape of DSI. So uh, the TLDR on me is that uh, I, I want to help um, work on aging research and, and uh, establish this new medical paradigm, just like crypto is a, is a new financial paradigm. Um, because I love life and I don't think I'd really want to die as long as I'm healthy. Um, so every year, if I, if I get to 99 and I'm healthy, I probably want to be also a hundred and I, I wouldn't really think about it, um, for, uh, many hundreds of years because I think it's, it's uh, impossible to, to predict how, uh, technology singularity humanity will look like more than a hundred years in the future. So, um, yeah, just let's just focus on, on health. Uh, I, I, you asked Vincent, but uh, I also, un unlike most young people, uh, I know what it's feel like to to feel frail, like a, like an old person. Um, and not only, um, of course, I also loved my my grandma, and uh, I, I saw her suffer. But um, I personally also have had many health issues. I've spent a lot of time in hospitals, many surgeries. So um, I've always looked for solutions. Becoming a doctor wasn't really one, at least not for, for me. Um, biotech wasn't initially an option and in Romania, there wasn't much to do there. Um, but I was really good at science, uh, passionate about biology, but also um, computer science, math, all of these things. So I kind of went into that direction of doing practical things. Um, then startups, entrepreneurship, um, I think initially it was kind of glamorous and I, I wanted to prove something to, to my, my bullies want recognition, but then, um, I, uh, kind of spent a time in a, in a sabbatical and, um, I had some financial freedom, I had some, I was investing and, uh, started, uh, investing in, in, uh, biotech and longevity startups as well. 
um, but also spend time on looking at existential risks, uh, improving the human condition, uh, AI safety, AGI, brain machine interfaces, all of these things. But ultimately, none of this, these existential risks or any of these technologies seemed to be likely to, to be a problem or, or um, to see the, this amazing future in, in my lifetime. And uh, aging is basically 100% going to make us suffer and die. And so I, I just didn't want to, to, to have the same uh, suffering and pain in the future when I would be old that I had when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, I, I just made sense to, to work on this, uh, at least it helps the world med- medium term to, to long term and potentially my own health as well. Um, and when aging isn't the biggest problem, I would definitely go on to make humanity more resilient to help with existential risks, global or galactic or whatever catastrophes. Um, I'm super excited to see the future. Um, so right now, the bottleneck in the longevity field, which I think we should focus on more, um, is this diversity uh, of startups. It doesn't really exist. I think there is enough billionaires and and um, and funding to to invest in things at like the angel slash VC level, um, but they usually don't find things to enough startups to invest in that are that are uh, credible. And um, they're kind of ending up putting money into these behemoths like Calico. The Google founders put a few billion in, in Calico since 2013, and it gets like super bloated and bureaucratic. Um, Altos Labs recently with uh, Jeff Bezos um, and um, Art Ventures and, and like super credible people from from pharma, um, also three point something billion. And many such, uh, even even Brian Armstrong started a, a smaller one and. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, mega startups um, with a few hundred million and so on. But VitaDAO can basically, uh, the reason I'm, I'm working on, on VitaDAO is, is we can accelerate the research that would otherwise just be some some p- paper but would never become a, a med- like medicine. Um, it, we can sort of accelerate those, create startups that wouldn't otherwise exist um, and have this scalable democratic participation. It's it's really a new type of organization, as you all know, these these DAOs. Um, and I'm excited because we can be a, sort of a first order organization, um, potentially becoming as big and resourceful as a as a small country, maybe maybe bigger. And the will of the people cannot be stopped. So if there's enough uh, people, and the more people sort of get bought into this uh, new paradigm, I think. Um, yeah, the, the will of the people cannot be stopped. So um, this is, I think, the best way we can make sure that uh, we can have an impact. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, so let's change gears and talk about DSI a little bit. The idea for this episode kind of came from my attendance at DSI London earlier this year. And I had to- I-, I told lots of people afterwards that I had gone to a fantastic conference about DSI and like 70% of the people even you know, who are very much in the Web3 ecosystem, um, ask me, what's DSI? So DSI is um, the much younger sibling to um, well-established players like DeFi and DSOC, even if DSOC doesn't always go by that name, but basically DAO societies, been, uh, but, uh, DAO ecosystems have been around for a while. So DSI obviously is decentralized science. But maybe question for you, Vincent, what in regular science requires disruption and where does the blockchain component come in to kind of make it decentralized? That's a great question. I think um, like one obvious answer, I think like even with the other siblings, like with decentralized finance and centralized finance is of course, like what's the problems in centralized science? And I think there's multiple. So one is of course, um, like very um, kind of like funding bodies that are very bureaucratic. Like for example, BNIH in the US is like one of the biggest funding bodies. It's like kind of like a monopoly on scientific funding, especially also in the health space. And um, they of course have like similar mechanisms. Like most of the application processes, for example, take half a year, like a, a very long time and are very bureaucratic. And most people don't get funding at the end of it, but spend weeks or months um, preparing the applications, waiting for an answer. And even if they get the money, they also oftentimes don't get the follow-up and not the incentives to actually succeed with the science. The only thing that's really measured is um, publications. And I think 
That's one component. So it's like the issues in centralized funding of science, then the is issues of centralized um, publication and accredit like um, status of science. So kind of like central bodies like Nature and other publishers um, centralizing the publishing of science and gatekeeping, of course, some of the uh, most groundbreaking science. So some of the leading science that is now, some of which won Nobel Prizes, like wasn't able to get published. And that tells you something of, about of course, the state of this gatekeeping, that it's also a bit um, like can lead to groupthink and can have other issues. And I'm not even saying that like centralized science doesn't have a place. It's more, of course, about um, uh, acknowledging that like ultimately a lot of things could be done more effectively and in a more open and free way in a decentralized fashion. Like in a similar sense, I don't think like centralized finance will go away. Like the Fed or like central banking will probably still be a thing for a while, but ultimately there's huge value in, in the decentralized side of things. So I think maybe to break it down concretely, I think funding is one of the biggest ones. And of course that we're directly, for example, tackling with VitaDAO and Molecule. Um, publishing, I think, is like another um, huge one where there's also, of course, a lot of issues with the centralization as mentioned. Then there's others, like for example, access to laboratory resources and infrastructure. Like it's very hard for you and me and most people in the world to access the computational or um, laboratory infrastructures to do science. Um, like it's also gate kept in that sense. Like you need a PhD, you need to be at like a um, famous lab or something to even have access to the tools to do science. Like it's very hard to be like um, most places in the world and practice science. It's, it's very gate kept in that sense. Like it's ultimately, I think the, the most stark, I think um, information is to an extent, of course, that like only every thousandth person is like a scientist. And um, so 99.99% of humanity can't participate in science. Like they can't participate in the funding of science. They can't do and or execute science. They can't easily publish science because they don't have a PhD. They don't have access to the labs. So I think that's um, like maybe the, the most important point is that it's way too hard to participate in science for the majority of humanity. And it's... I think um, as evident, for example, with startups, it's uh, important to have like the disruptors that um, can happen in like a kid's um, room or like in a garage where someone is just able to, to um, do science, for example, or to participate in science, um, even if it's like just like one alternative, for example, uh, for scientific funding, for scientific publishing, for scientific credentials and other aspects. So I think... Um, increasingly, it, it is becoming an option, um, also with the scientists we talk to, there's still, a lot of them are still at universities and getting centralized sources of funding, but we've been in sometimes like way quicker, instead of taking half a year, we took maybe one or two weeks of funding them, or sometimes maybe a month. Uh, we've been way more helpful, at least what many of them said, in really providing them with really valuable feedback and information and helping them translate their research. And like while they're kind of like the interest lands a bit flat with their normal research, like no one really cares. No one is really aware of their research. With us, they have like sometimes community of like five or 10,000 people that really follow their research, engage with questions, want to understand what they're researching, which they also really embrace. Um, so I think that's just a few things. But I think in general, the, the main thing is that a lot of scientists also are very unhappy with the current system because it is so gatekept, because there are in many ways, very underpaid and not fairly rewarded also for their work. And because it's such a like long and hard process to, to get to the other side of like a scientific discovery. Uh, and it doesn't need to be, I think, to an extent. So I think that's the, yeah, I think my thesis for why decentralized science is important. And of course, ultimately as a playground for novel experiments, like for novel experiments in science funding, for novel experiments in science publishing, or in, in uh, novel forms of credentials and status. And I think all of those are important to also improve the centralized and old system. I can also add about a problem that's maybe closer to people's everyday life um, at the intersection of science and engineering a bit in medicine and also patriarchal government, paternalistic sort of nanny state. Um, I can give an example for, uh, with, with um, clinical trials and, and uh, regulations of, uh, of uh, drugs in general. Aging is not considered a disease. And 
the same happened with um, birth control, for example. It, it wasn't women couldn't try the birth control pill because it wasn't considered a disease, right? So you couldn't have a drug for this, and so they had to go and to try out the birth control pills in the 40s in in various um, smaller uh, countries that had uh, lesser regulations, and only after the the women sort of lobbied the government a lot after many years. Then the FDA also approved it in the U.S. Um, you, you may be, a lot of you, I, I super recommend watching Dallas Buyers Club as well, uh, talking about um, HIV in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Uh, people had this terminal illness, but they were not allowed to try some you know, protein supplements or something. The FDA was like really trying to, to be super paternalistic and not allow people that had a terminal disease um, to try something that wasn't approved. Um and they, they found ways with something that's not that dissimilar from a DAO, a Dallas, Dallas Buyers Club, for example. These people would sort of uh, buy membership to a sort of club, like tokens, right? And then they would get medicine for free. So they weren't like technically selling the, the drugs, um, which was the, the issue with, with selling drugs that weren't approved. And many, many such examples, uh, I would say uh, moral failure of the, the current system so the current uh, system works by pre- by um, preventing people from uh, making mistakes, being super um, careful, but um, nobody sees the risk in delaying uh, access to life-saving medicine. So the, 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 in the status quo, people are dying of terminal illnesses. Even with COVID, I can give an example, right? That if we had done challenge trials, we could have saved potentially hundreds of thousands, millions of lives. But usually if something goes wrong and a and hundred people die of, of some side effects or, or there's some issue, that's a tragedy. But millions of people dying is just a statistic. And uh, the incentives are set up for regulators. They're, they're good people. They're trying to, to help uh, um, prevent issues uh, and side effects and so on. But they don't have an incentive to to uh, look at effective and expected value. I hear the argument. I think kind of you're in danger of kind of veering off into utilitarianism there, where basically you kind of just weigh how many lives on one side and how many lives on the other side. And basically the integrity of the person who kind of ends up making the decision um, has no input or the way that people die. Because obviously you die of a natural disease. This is not the same as dying in a clinical trial. So those are very, I mean, I, I know the outcome is the same, but morally it feels very different to me so i kind of see what wh- why this is wh- why this has m- been met with resistance so i understand people get covid anyway and, and so if with that's why i think anyway i don't want to get it too much into challenge trials the pros and cons and so on but let's focus on like people who are terminally ill and and they have nothing to lose right uh why not let them make the decision and try some something yeah, we had we had this discussion here in Germany probably like ten years ago or so about legalizing marijuana um, for for terminally ill people, and then basically there were the the people who opposed this who said, well, it's a gateway dr- drug, and you know you know you t- you you start taking marijuana and then you end up taking whatever. But basically, obviously, for dying people, this is this is I mean, r- regardless of whether the gateway drug argument is good in principle or not. For dying people, it's definitely not a good argument. Um, I've kind of jotted down a couple of topics I kind of want to talk about in detail for decentralized science, um, namely their kind of funding, widening participation, so citizen c- scientists and so on, publishing, and then basically transitioning research from you know labs into the actual applications and kind of looking at um, the effect of patents and patent laws. Those are kind of the major areas kind of that I jotted down. Um, and I kind of want to talk about how um, uh, how blockchains and decentralized technologies can help for each one of those. But before we do that, um, I have like a higher level question. Um, for which kind of scientific disciplines is DSI actually applicable, right? So basically say, I'm by training, I'm a physicist, right? So say I want to fund um, LH, uh, 
uh, the Large Hadron Collider too, right? So I'll I'll need several billion dollars. Probably won't fund that with a DAO. So kind of wh what kind of scientific disciplines do you actually see as within the scope of DSI? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I ultimately I think it's uh, in stages. I think like long term. Uh, potentially every area of science could be funded with it. Like Juan Benet made a great point of like the different uh, stairways of like in increase in public goods funding and, and scientific funding that could happen via blockchains. And I think it could rival uh, those of nation states at some point and thus also take on those mega projects. I think to your point for now, how I view it, and Vita was a great example, is these smaller research projects with a extremely strong overlap with the crypto community's interest. And I think longevity is an interesting example because ultimately, I think, um, as, as Lauren said, it's a new paradigm that resonates with people in crypto that also um, view crypto as a new paradigm to do things in a uh, better, like foundationally better way. And I think in, in that sense, those areas that are closest to the interests of um, crypto people are probably those that, um, and are already those that are getting the most traction, like longevity being a great example. Like most, um, people I can think of kind of like leading the crypto revolution, like have longevity as one of the core interests in the scientific sphere. I think others are, of course, um, other that are very close to the heart of many people, like climate research, for example, being a good example. Um, and then those, um, I think that are really, tangible and almost like consumers, maybe not the right word, but that, that are very uh, easy to understand for like a big part of people. And I think that um, are able to also plug into some of the native, of course, tools with um, with crypto and capital formation being one. And of course, to your point, it's still hard to raise like a billion dollars in crypto for like a wild scientific project that is can mainly be considered a donation, like the large hadron collider or other um, mega projects in physics, maybe. So I do think that like the smaller uh, check sizes, let's say, of donations and grants, and um, for example, like with IP NFTs, are already proving to be more successful. And especially, of course, the research that can do a, a lot with a little, but is still lacking the resources. Like ultimately, I think uh, the Large Hadron Collider, of course, got funded. I think there's some amazing research you could do with like small amounts of money that a lot of people would want to fund, but like that they don't have the access uh, to fund and don't discover. So I think there's a lot of that. So I think basically scientists with large audiences, for example, I think can tap into a bunch of crowdfunding methods, crypto being, I think, one um, interesting one. So, and I think it's similarly, of course, for um, other areas, for example, on publishing, even cryptographic research and some of the research crypto projects do, I think, obviously it lends itself very well to be uh, published and kind of like reviewed in very crypto native ways. So there's actually some projects uh, doing that, kind of like exploring publishing of, of applied crypto research um, with crypto tools. And I think that will probably also be one of the first successful use cases of crypto publishing, just because there's a very high overlap, obviously, of um, crypto people being eager to explore and dog food their own solutions to do their own research. So I think, but from there, I expect it to grow to kind of every area and, of course, a bit driven by the interests of the people that are participating, um, not only financially, but also with their time. So I think yeah, that, that that's kind of like my intuition. <laughs> So on a high level, it makes sense. Uh, if you look at the traditional financial system, the traditional financial system does fund uh, a lot of biotech startups. And actually, the role of finance is ultimately to you know allocate um, to allocate human resources productively, and if it can be allocated towards science productively, financial financial system will do it, and. In some way, we can think of okay, we're trying to develop. Um, we have we have an emerging financial system on our hands, and this is the exploration of okay, how can it be used to fund productive productive science? Could you tell us about some? Is there any early success story like uh, a project that was able to do interesting science? Um, by leveraging either the underlying blockchains in a special way or by uh, leveraging the financial primitives in a, in a in a special way. 
Yeah, I think, of course, we're uh, biased, um, being heavily involved also in, for example, VitaDAO. I think VitaDAO was definitely one of the first and um, biggest successes, I think, in, um, on the first side, like raising the necessary capital to uh, fund research, but also funding a broad variety of different research projects and trying out different mechanisms to fund research. I think there's actually also a few others, although I'm not sure if they, they uh, fully count into decentralized science. Like the biggest that comes to mind was um, this uh, craze of Vitalik getting a lot of Shiba Inu coins and uh, donating them to COVID India's relief, but also doing a lot of kind of fast grants via crypto with, with an organization called Balvi for COVID research. So I think they almost deployed like over 100 million or approximately 100 million into COVID research. And um, there's some good information on it if you um, search Balvi. I think on, on VitaDAO, the earliest successes that I've seen is just um, in a very short amount of time, g uh, giving uh, the necessary resources to the researcher, but also really having our community um, to to give feedback and input on the researcher. Like a lot of the researchers have ideas, but our community kind of like challenged their ideas, gave feedback, improved their ideas, funded the research, then the first results come back and and they are inconclusive or like they don't know what to do next. And our co community like looks deeply into it and comes up with novel ideas. And I think that's actually the power of decentralized science in action is not like an siloed, isolated lab that were, were like might still be um, waiting for their um, application uh, in the traditional system where we already funded it, have the first round of reviews, reevaluated the research uh, already on onto the second round of research. And I think that's really the power. It's like this crowd intelligence to an extent. Like there's a great book on this uh, by Michael Nielsen. Um, I'm not sure if it's called Network Science or something like this, but basically making the point that this kind of um, research um is much more likely to succeed. Uh, even historically, there's like many such cases um, of very collaborative and open ways to co co um, yeah advance the research. So, yeah, right. but on on VitaDAO uh, on the website, we have basically an overview of all the research projects and also sharing some of the project updates. So that's like uh, I think the best place with an overview of our concrete projects. But I think there's also a few others. So as a former scientist, I can tell you one of the nightmares of a scientist in this day and age is being scooped. So basically having someone else kind of publish the same research before you. And if you think about it, it actually speaks to um, a large degree of incentive misalignment, right? Because if you look at um, the incentives of the individual scientists and they don't line up with um, the incentives of, you know, science as a larger field. So you 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 would think that um, if some, something needs to be found out, basically every everyone should benefit who've kind of who's working on this and shouldn't be like the first person to publish it in a you know in a notable journal. It should be everyone. So how do you think DSI can kind of help break up this uh, this incentive disalignment that we actually see a lot in traditional academia? Totally. I think the, the, the one way is, of course, um, to really have like um, cleared um, traces of like who contributed what. And I think actually cryptographic proofs um, already are very good at doing so. Um, for example, there's a project we also support called Lateral for Knowledge Graphs. And um, basically, you can submit knowledge and it's like every knowledge submission is written to the blockchain and has cryptographic proofs like your ENS or zero X address contributed this piece of knowledge. And I think we, we are working on, on ways to do that in um, also some of the more like uh, research happening in the offline world. Of course, like if some researcher is doing research at his lab and shares his report, um, it's kind of like still very uh, manual and still um, traditional. But the goal is, of course, um, to bring more of that online and, for example, into cloud labs and um, more computational work where everyone's contributions are um, accredited, like where ultimately if I contribute this data set, um, it, it shows that I shared this data set, but also maybe like other people contributed to that data set. Um, and then you can just like see the whole chain of contributions and, and for example, also retroactively reward 
uh, based on the contributions or give ownership in the research uh, coming out at the other end based on the contributions and also evaluating the contributions. So there's a lot of work being done on this. Um, like another interesting project on this is, for example, HyperCerts, which is giving these impact certificates to every contributor. And then has also like an impact evaluator. So they're kind of like also building this out in parallel. I, I think it's still early days. And our goal is also to fully integrate this um, into how we assign credit uh, yeah, to researchers. But I think a lot of it is also needs to be figured out, especially with the a lot of the real world research happening at labs where it is not um, digitally submitted every minute. Um, and um, basically, if you look at um, the impact of widening participation, so as you said, um, one in a thousand people worldwide is a scientist. That's super interesting statistic. Do you think you actually need to gatekeep this in any way? Do you kind of need a reputation system for kind of contributing knowledge? How do you make sure that there isn't too much noise for people to actually, you know, you know, get a clear signal of what other relevant people are doing? Yeah, I think ultimately it's a bit like with other things in the internet, like an explosion of information needs like better curation and better discovery mechanisms to filter through the noise. But I do think that like, for example, giving, um, People like having a hundred times the amount of research might not lead to a hundred times the impact, but it will probably increase the impact if it's of similar quality. And, and, and of course, also f following novel directions of research that people in the traditional system might not have been able to follow. So I think that's actually the main hope that ultimately very high risk, high reward or very contrarian research might be more likely to be funded in a decentralized way. And even by having different cohorts of people Uh, fund the research or do the research will increase the diversity of the research funded and the uh, ways it is funded. So I think that's uh, usually, I think, good. I think you, you could see it, of course, with art, that, like the traditional artwork doesn't like what uh, the crypto art wor world is doing, but I think it increases the diversity of art and, uh, and the diversity of sources of funding for artists. And I think it's very similar for scientists. Lawrence, uh, you, you wanted to cover some ex examples of early early successes in d-science yeah could you could you give us some examples i think the the best way to look at it um with how d and why it's so important especially in longevity since it's so dismissed by the incumbents um i would say imagine if crypto had needed government funding most research usually needs government funding right it would never have happened you you need this sort of bottom up approach you need the people to say we we want to do things this way we want to fund this crazy experiment uh we want to take higher risks instead of that that sort of um iterative process that usually happens in in science um so v at, at least in crypto you had vcs private money um that could fund these companies But VCs can't really fund researchers before there is any IP, before there is a company formed, right? So I think we funded about 15 projects um, and most of like, or at least uh, almost half of them, I think, wouldn't have happened. Um, they were just academic researchers that had expertise in something, but they were not starting companies. They were not going to go raise VC funds. They didn't have the IP, so we gave them funds to create that. So um, I think if you look at uh, the the ones funded in in labs like um, uh, Newcastle by Victor Korolchuk and Washington University in, in the U.S. Jonathan Ann, Oslo University Evander Fang, um, these projects have been advancing quite a lot. They've now built IP, uh, most of them, um, Apoptosense as well, and and so some of them are ready to be spun out into startups, and then you can get traditional angels and VCs involved. Um, so we're going to have the first uh, three spin-outs, I think, this year. Stay tuned on, on all of that. We've deployed about uh, 4 million into the, the projects so far, um, with all funded by... Um, initially, we had this auction for uh, anyone to be able to bid and, and buy the Vita tokens, and that's how uh, VitaDAO got born in June 2021. And then we also had strategic contributors um, that are more institutional, big pharma like Pfizer, crypto VCs, uh, some some individuals like Balaji Srinivasan and 
and uh, Joe Betts Lacroix or, or Retrobio, which is also a longevity company, just kind of uh, expanding the network of VitaDAO to institutions as well. But mostly, it, I think they're um, kind of bottom-up funds, um, and they are ready to be deployed in in uh, things that would otherwise uh, not happen as fast, and also some things that are safer, you know, partnerships with existing companies and so on. And if you want, I can also go into uh, some of the f- the cool aspects of each project, but I don't know if we have time for that. Let me maybe uh, dig in here a little bit more. Um, so um, I remember the Pfizer announcement, and it actually caught a lot of flack in the ecosystem. So what's in it? What is what's in it for Pfizer? What's VitaDAO doing that Pfizer couldn't do on its own? Well, a lot of it is um, deal flow. We get all of these amazing projects. Um, they help us um, incubate them. It, you, usually, they, it's not like a VC fund where people come for funding and they have a pitch deck or anything. It's a lot uh, of our uh, team members, including people from Pfizer, that have been helping for almost a year now. Um, and so these projects get sort of advanced, accelerated, and then they would be ready for Pfizer to lead a Series A, for example. And um, also they get to contribute to this uh, new way of doing things um, with DAOs and DSI. I think it's also a learning experiment for them. It's it's sort of a win-win thing. And another aspect of it is uh, with the Vita token, you don't only get governance rights, you also have um, a bunch of uh, perks. And uh, for institutions, the, the most important one is to be able to participate uh, financially in some of the projects we funded or will fund at the similar terms with us, like syndicating with us, uh, either via fractionalizing these IP NFTs, where uh, a community, the community that has tokens can stake the tokens and, and purchase uh, uh, some of those, but also through a sidecar fund, a regular VC fund that can uh, put money into these uh, spinouts uh, before they're ready for the traditional VC, so basically at better, better value, valuation, and you only be uh, you're only able to put money into these VC funds that are sidecar to Vita DAO if you have Vita DAO tokens, uh, Vita tokens. But do Vita token holders automatically partake in this? So basically, if, is there is this kind of just an incubation crash for um, f- for Pfizer to kind of reap the benefits after or do kind of Vita contributors automatically also partake in any upside that's kind of to be had from these projects? So people can uh, get Vita tokens by contributing capital or or work. And then the Vita tokens uh, basically provide uh, that um, those resources to put into both capital and work put into these projects and VitaDAO will uh, own a lot of the, the upside. So a, a lot of these will come back to the treasury and so on. But also people, including Pfizer and so on, can get involved in a- asset by asset specifically. Like, you know, you get uh, researchers that know more about a specific thing. They might help that project get some uh, Coral to uh, NFT pro- uh tokens instead of just Vita as like a whole portfolio thing and and also potentially put money into that doubling down and and also it it gives us an indication markets usually give you an indication right of uh what is uh more valuable and of course it's going to help us with uh, figuring out uh, the the asset value of our portfolio too because we have about six million liquid but uh, also a lot of like paper assets and paper gains and so on but once we put put it out such that other people can buy pieces of each asset, then we also know the value of our, our treasury. And that's, that's something that doesn't happen in biotech. You have to wait until pharma buys your asset, or you get to an IPO as a biotech company. Um, and, or, or of course it's, it's the equity of the companies as well, but usually companies have multiple assets. This is a sort of bringing IP into the 21st century digitally and have it in, having it liquid and priced by the market. I think it's very important. I think we've covered quite a few of the topics that kind of we wanted to, to cover in terms of DSI. So uh, basically, I will tick off funding, widening participation, and uh, taking research from lab to application. One area that is a huge pain point for scientists today that we haven't really covered that much 
is publishing. So obviously publishing for everyone who's not in science, never has been in science, um, it's a very antiquated process. It's kind of like you're sending a letter to the Royal Academy about your findings and basically they're kind of maybe passing it on to other people who can kind of comment on it and you kind of get it back as a letter. Actually, today it's emails, but it's it's very much could be a letter. I mean, it takes... I've, I've actually had articles that have taken years to publish, like literal years. So what's, what's there in publishing, um, that we can, we can set up in a more efficient way, um, with, um, the help of, uh, uh, blockchains and design? Yeah. I think maybe like one good summary of the current papers is like, it's still these paper PDFs that are very static, like that are not actually made for like the internet age. Like they're like still you could do them on a typewriter, like even AI papers. You have to pay for color. So basically exactly. if you, if you, if you submit a paper and it has color graphs, you actually have to pay extra. I mean, as a scientist, you have to pay for publishing depending on where you publish. And then you have to pay extra if you have color graphs as if people don't actually all look at the same PDF anyways. It's, it's, it's maddening. And and I think that's the thing is it's still stuck in like almost like a pre-computer age, not even internet. And I think um, the one is like almost like the medium. I think like, of course, the, the what's the goal of publishing is to share research with other researchers so other research, and with the like broad public that like all of us can understand this research that we funded indirectly with tax dollars. And that we, of course, for example, in a, um, use crypto terminology, can fork the research and build research on top of it. And I think the one way is like in the in the medium, which I think has now like a lot of ways to evolve. Like, of course, from like having different medium, for example, interactive models in the research, but also where you maybe can like challenge the research and or where you can contribute to the research and where it's like a living breathing document and, and thing. So there's actually projects in DSI, for example, uh, one is called DSI Labs that is um, building that, like these interactive artifacts. Uh, there's pr uh, projects like Research Hub that uh, Coinbase founder um, Brian, jo um, Brian Armstrong um, created, and which is like a publishing platform and a bit like Reddit um, for research and, and also with collaborative features. I think the interesting things, for example, in VitaDAO's a case we for example did like a biomarker review um and literally started this uh to announce it in the with like a bounty in um our governance forum and we're just like hey like this is the bounty for people putting together this review and i think like a week later with like four amazing researchers do together like a 20 page review of like the different biomarkers uh, and, and but the interesting thing is it's like a more continuous process so now we're like building a knowledge graph for for these biomarkers um, and tr to basically put all the all the knowledge and all the different, almost like as a literature review of the different biomarker research onto a knowledge graph where you now can cryptographically with your zero ad address on this tool called Lateral, um, can I actually see a demo, I think, on ldg.lateral.io to just create your own knowledge graph, but um, where people can then like add claims, question claims, and then at, at the end get rewarded based on their contributions. So if you're jump into then our like um, biomarker knowledge graph and you refute like a lot of the research and give sources and uh, or if you add a lot of uh, evidence and and interesting research you get accredited for that but that's then like still not the final result like ultimately it's a collaborative living thing and i think that's that hints at like what publishing in a more decent native way can look like it's it's just like much more collaborative much quicker uh, and and the uh, assignment of like who contributed what is very clear and cryptographically proven, literally with your like zero X address on chain. And I think um, there's uh, way more possibilities uh, in this direction. I think of course like um, having, for example, the equivalent of GitHub libraries that people can fork and run into cloud laboratories that even wet lab research can be forked, and you can maybe like change the mod uh, molecule, run the research again with one click instead of having to set up. Uh, your own lab with millions of dollars um, that you can literally do research that currently might not even be possible at like a modern lab because something might be missing. Th 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 that research you can in the future do from your desktop browser um, and click run 
and and replicate the research because that's I think also a very important point. Balaji made this on on a podcast with him, and there's now also a tool building this called a Scholar. Um, is that like a lot of the current research doesn't replicate. So not only is publishing completely broken, but also most of the research is just false. Like it doesn't replicate. And we've seen this with Alzheimer's where now the government probably spent like 50 billion, like something on this order of magnitude of research based on um, hypothesis and research that proved out to be not not even wrong and false, but literally fraudulent. Like it, it was like basically tampered with. And of course, that's also something where crypto strong is temp tamper proof. So ultimately having cryptographic signs that specific artifacts, for example, that sometimes are tampered with are cryptographically proven a bit like if you take a photo with a camera that uh, it has a cryptographic proof that it's not like a deep fake, but that it's actually a real photo. So I think a similar thing will also be necessary and happen in Yeah, with with cam uh, with like research artifacts and like research devices that the, the data is proven to be correct and and not tampered with. I would also add that uh, we are a big community. Apart from our uh, main focus on funding these these uh, research projects and spinning them out in companies, we have a bunch of initiatives that people start, like like this biomarker thing that uh, Vincent mentioned, but also a, a peer review system that uses the token to uh, upvote and, and things like to give uh, people incentives to provide good reviews. Um, outside of the usual journal system, but also a journal we, we call, uh, so the peer review system is called TLDR, the Longevity uh, Decentralized Review, and uh, the, a journal, the Longevist, um, but also Vincent started a bunch of initiatives, actually, the one with um, uh, the Gitcoin round for longevity, I think uh, we had about 500k from Vitalik, and uh, a lot of it went into the longevity prize, um, and uh, so we kind of rewarding Uh, progress in in the space as as a whole um, with, with small incremental prizes instead of like a, a big one that uh, can be hit in, in 10 years or so and also other initiatives like a fellowship to just have more people join the field uh, students micro grants for, for students to get into longevity um, a hackathon and all kinds of initiatives like that that uh, are not usually mentioned yeah and i think maybe actually like just to add this um, a small example, like with the longevity prize, the first prize we did was a hypothesis prize where everyone, like it could be like a 14 year old or like a like established researcher, could pub um, could contribute basically a submission of like a contrarian, like underappreciated idea to solve um, aging and longevity, and with I think over 200 submissions, and of course all of them are blinded, and the the uh, top ideas uh, not only get um, kind of recognition and are discussed on podcasts and. Uh, but also get uh, financial prizes. So people didn't have to pay to submit their applications. They didn't need a PhD. Uh, literally some very young people or some people that are 30 years in the field applied. And maybe the young person wins because we don't even know who, who applied basically in the blinding process. Um, and, and I think the interesting thing there is, again, that maybe there are like amazingly smart, well, red people that are just going through the, the longevity reddit that might have better ideas on like contrarian novel ideas to solve it than some phds who are like 30 years in the field and might have gotten more dogmatic than like a weird nerd on the internet uh, that just let the read the literature so that's one example of something which goes also in this direction of um yeah rewarding knowledge and information and, and um, not just the execution of research Another example is also incentivizing people to uh, disprove a popular research paper. So we're going to have a prize for that. We have a prize for biomarkers uh, with Methuselah Foundation that also you might know from uh, the famous sort of uh, Vitalik sending them uh, all the, like half the Shiba, sorry, half the Dogilon uh, uh, coins that he got. Um, it's a few hundred million, I think, in, in Dogilon. A bunch, of, a bunch of ideas for prizes that are coming up as well. Yeah, so listeners, check out longevity.review. That's a really interesting link. I am curious, how does this new collaborative model of publishing interact with the IP system? Because in the intellectual property system, anything that is prior art or prior knowledge, you, you cannot file a patent for it. And then you need the intellectual property in order to build commerce of It, so that MetaDAO and Pfizer, these guys have something investable uh, for the future. 
I, I tend to see a contradiction of terms here, right? So if 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 the if the early science is being done in a collaborative fashion and it's all public knowledge, then wouldn't it be really hard to actually build off IP and then get into the finance side of it? Yeah, I think that's of course like also shows a bit like how the current system is broken that it like can't be collaborative or very open because then you kind of like can't file a patent and and the problem is actually is like um you can be against patent but it's like if you invalidate a patent there is no incentive to for someone to uh, pay 100 200 million which is necessary for the clinical trials so actually there's people dying because some scientists um uh basically published too early some stuff that could otherwise have become a patent and otherwise have a financial incentive with clinical trials to reach patients. So actually, um, basically in theory, it's easy to say, okay, patents are bad, but in the current system, if you like don't have a patent, you don't have a chance to bring it into humans. So I think that's important to understand, but I think of course you can still generate a lot of ideas in the, in the open. Of course, there's like a few things you can't give away as a researcher to otherwise it would invalidate your, your patent um, filing. Um, and of course those things need to be confidential, but of course you can also, um, enable more collaborative work by 20 people signing an NDA, which is what's happening, for example, in, in Vitor's case concretely, if we funded the research, say with $20,000, and there is some very like uh, confidential, important information, every researcher in the community that's stepping up and bringing this project forward, of course, can access the data, but has to sign an NDA that they don't share it. So it doesn't invalidate the potential patent filing. But you still have the benefit then of, of this co collaboration. The whole community can still get like video updates, text updates that don't invalidate the patent and give away the crucial information that would. And I think so in, we're, of course, trying to work around those issues that are fundamental. Um, and I think in the future, they, there might even be um, more ways to enable uh, collaboration without uh, giving this away. But to your point, I think ultimately the purpose is not just to get a paper out of it like for the researcher but it's to solve a disease and ultimately do so in the most cost effective way and of course to share the information with the community with the research field with the people that supported research but i think we we're, we're finding a way to do so and of course like people present at conferences all the time uh, about stuff they're working on that doesn't have patents filed yet but of course usually have them to like for example, not say which molecule they're investigating that has these effects, but they just say molecule A, B, and C. Like, I, I want to highlight and clarify the difference between science and, and just publishing and then drug discovery, drug development, right? So uh, in um, the current, mo we, we are mostly playing within the current model of drug discovery, of just uh, keeping the actual molecular structure and, and confidential things uh, private and ultimately getting a patent and so on. Um, and working with pharma and, and biotech and so on, because yeah, currently through the current regulatory system, it's very expensive. Uh, you need uh, billions for per, per each drug because some drugs fail. Um, so ideally, um, we would move towards more of a prize model where the government says, Hey, if you extend healthy lifespan by one year, we earn actually, there's a few trillion for just the US that, that you would earn in, in uh, not only extra productivity uh, for, from those people on taxes and so on, but also not having to pay for sick care, Medicare, keeping people in a poor state of health for longer. Uh, so they would say, look, if anyone does this or, or helps with uh, delay Alzheimer or, or reverse Alzheimer's by a certain percentage or something, you get this, this many billion or something, which is what's worth, what it's worth it to us. So we're trying with the Longevity Prize and, and other uh, initiatives to set up uh, pay for success prizes where life insurance or governments or, or philanthropy pull, pulls this money and only pays it on success, like the usual prize. Uh, but right now it's more for like repurposing existing compounds, which are cheap to get into clinical trials like rapamycin. Uh, so we put up uh, some money for Brad Stanfield's uh, rapamycin trial, and he he's still still trying to get the rest up to 350k, and uh, we're also still trying to get a, a payer that would pay potentially like a million or two million or something, if it would show success in in extending healthy lifespan in in that uh, in that study or or uh, subsequent studies and so on. Super excited. Yeah, I think that's one uh, actually mechanism that, for example, Optimism and Gitcoin and others, of course, pioneered also a lot is uh, RP uh, 
like like a retroactive public goods funding, like having basically incentives for someone to proactively fund something because they then potentially have upside in being retroactively uh, rewarded. So there's a lot of experiments on those. Like we're collaborating with the Protocol Labs project called HyperCerts, which is building these impact certificates. Um, Gitcon is also involved on that. And the goal is, of course, that beyond science for everything, you, you, you then can, in a very native way, get like one impact certificate for a thousand bucks. And if it's able to solve, for example, a longevity, you get like a financial reward potentially, or you just get a status of having been part of that um, breakthrough. But I think that's like an interesting new mechanism where you don't need patents anymore. Um, but of course, there are some other um, diseases where you clearly need clinical trials. Um, and of course, like the repurposing of research is um, of, of basically off patent drugs is much cheaper because it's already proven to be safe in humans. You, you have much less um, burden to prove that this uh, research is um, like not deadly. Uh, so I think that's some interesting experiments, basically. I think that this is also enabling, which like the current market system uh, that is doing science is completely not good at it. So I think in that sense, like this whole public good space of, of Ethereum and crypto is also extremely interesting and, and useful in the context of science. How does VitaDAO make funding decisions? Is it literally like a coin vote or is there like some sort of reputation system involved? Because I imagine that a lot of the um, decisions to be made um, rely on the actors having an extraordinary amount of information. We have a, what's called a senior reviewers, a bunch of experts uh, that review projects when they're ready and... Um, we put up a proposal and put their stamp of approval, basically with a, a brief review and, and a conviction score from one to five. And then the token holders are informed by that. Um, ultimately, they could still say, yeah, these uh, experts are not getting it. It's, it's, you know, it's our DAO together with the token. You know, if it's majority of the token supply wants that, they can say, look, we're going to do this crazy experiment that the experts are saying it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not good, but it hasn't happened. It's usually been, yeah, people are kind of listening to to the experts and, and deploying capital. Uh, and smartly. how do you become an expert? You can uh, oh, we, we curate. Uh, curate. Um, so anyone can join and, and so on and, and try to do various bounties, like source a project for us and get tokens for that or, or, or dollars and so on. But um, we as a group of... Uh, well, there, there's many PhDs, postdocs, and professors and so on already in the group. And when there's a new person or we reach out to, to the top experts um, in the field, we kind of know all of them um, to help us and just ask them to review. And just there's a sort of consensus in the group that this person is a senior reviewer. I think the, maybe the important thing is also uh, you can also just come in, even like sidetrack the process. And like put up a project for, for governance proposal and review. So you don't have to follow that process in every step. But of course, then basically the review happens completely in the open oftentimes and just on the governance forum. I think another thing is, of course, that we are also still experimenting on this like review and governance component. I think some of the like early steps of this review, you can also do on chain. Um, and of course, I think there's some interesting stuff like with like we're now introducing like basically following the, the governance patterns that others are doing, which is delegation. And of course, then, for example, encouraging bigger token holders to delegate to scientists they um, like trust or find interesting. Um, but I think there's other more interesting mechanisms that are still super early, even from the technology. So if we have, for example, a snapshot um, as a mechanism, of course, they now, for example, enable, I think, quadratic voting quadratic voting since very recently with like a Gitcoin passport integration, if I'm not mistaken, but that happened like a few months ago. Like it wasn't even around like a year ago. And I think a lot of those governance experiments, like we want to be at the frontier, but we not, don't, also don't want to be uh, the guinea pig and like just focus on governance experiments for the sake of it. But we want to see, okay, like what proves promise. And I'm very certain that like the next five years, we will see a lot of, experimentation on governance mechanisms and then those that are the most promising i think we will also explore and adopt and of course that would be a governance proposal for the community so everyone can come in with a governance proposal to change governance and and that's something that actively we also have a working group um, working on governance 
Perfect. Thank you guys so much. So um, we will kind of attach a list of uh, DSI projects that we talked about to the show notes. But if one, if people want to partake in VitaDAO, um, where should they, where should they go? How can they become a part of this? I would say from the website, you can see a bunch of information and, and click join the Discord or join the community, or join our mission and th things like that. Um, and then I would say the Discord is definitely the best way. Uh, try to see what's going on, how you can help, um, even just come for a week to hang out with us and, and maybe you learn something, um, do some bounties potentially, um, apply to join the working group, do onboarding calls, uh, do, join the onboarding call and, and see how you could help. Um, we have a lot of people, we, we need a lot of people um, in, in various aspects from, from you know, coding, legal, marketing and all of that, but also of course the, the scientific aspects, especially recruiting uh, biotech operators to help us spin out these companies. Um, and also we have, um, I just uh, came this weekend to Montenegro, we have um, an experiment uh, pop-up uh, mini city called Zuzalu uh, here. And um, we, we have a focus on healthy living and, and longevity, uh, but also crypto research and um, public goods and um, uh, ZK and, and all of, all of these things to ultimately explore how we can build more new cities, potentially a jurisdiction for doing, um, for medical innovation and um, uh, potentially evolving VitaDAO towards a network state. So you can check out vitadao.com slash Zuzalu. And there you'll see to sign up as a visitor. We're full for, we have uh, uh, 200 uh, residents as a cap for now. And, um, you can join some of the conferences that are happening, uh, especially May 5 to 15th. There's a, a bunch of, uh, from zero to one classes in longevity biotech, but also uh, May 13, 14, basically a normal conference uh, for longevity. Uh, but also there's there's others on, um, on network states, uh, building new cities, charter cities, and alternatives to network states um, and so on. You, you'll see the schedule um, on there. Yeah. And I I think another place, um, of course, that we didn't talk that much about, it, but it's uh, with Molecule, basically, you can also have like an overview of like different research projects, even beyond longevity and see also a bunch of the other um, biotech DAOs that we support on bio.xyz, which is kind of like our program to support other people building these bio DAOs in other areas from like women's health to synthetic biology and other areas. So if you also want to discover other biotech DAOs, uh, go there. And I think another great place is on Ethereum slash DSI. It's like a explainer of also kind of like the pros and cons from uh, traditional science to decentralized science and the different projects and the different ideas. So that's a very good starting point. And then there's also like a DSI wiki if you just Google it with like a lot of information on almost every project in the space. And on dsi.global, you see like a bunch of events and meetups. So also for like local groups. Um, so there's a bunch now of like local communities like DSI London or DSI Berlin, like um, in a lot of cities popping up. I'm actually surprised. Like there's literally like an explosion, like from Belgrade to Tokyo to uh, India. It's really nice to see these communities pop up everywhere. So there's also a lot of local communities, similar to like early Ethereum or Bitcoin local communities now popping up. Fantastic. So no excuses not to get involved. Thank you both so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you.